and uh, thanks to all of you for staying till the very last session. Uh, I should begin by telling you that I'm here under uh, false pretenses. The schedule that you have says I'm from TAC. I actually don't have any relationship with TAC. We use their machines and of course we love them since we're at the University of Texas. However, I'm really a professor in the CS department and I have uh, joint appointments in the ECE department and our Applied Math Center, which has been renamed to the Odin Institute in honor of Tinsley Odin, who's one of the pioneers of finite element methods. Here's one slide on uh, my group. So we call ourselves the Intelligent Software Systems Group and uh, have roughly about 12 PhD students and postdocs. Our funding comes from three large DARPA projects that we're involved in. Uh, several NSF projects and we work with a lot of companies in the Austin area. Uh, we do a bunch of projects. Uh, there are three main projects though funded by these three DARPA uh, grants. Uh, one is what we call the Galois system. It's a system for parallel programming of unstructured problems and that's essentially what I want to talk about today. Uh, we've also done work on adaptive control systems for principled accuracy energy trade-offs in all kinds of computations. And then lately we've started to try and understand how to use machine learning in system software. So up there on the right is our, uh, or your left, is the logo for our project uh, which is called Galois. And you can see that uh, this center eye over there is similar to the main tower that we have on campus. So this logo was designed by one of our Portuguese collaborators who spent a year at UT. And I don't know whether you can see it, but if you look over there, you can actually see our football stadium. So it's the, one of the biggest stadiums in the US and it can hold about 100,000 people. And I'm told it's bigger than the Colosseum, although instead of massacring Christians right now, our football team is getting massacred by other teams, and that's causing a lot of distress. <laughs> we'll get better. We have a new coach. OK, so let's get to graphs. Unstructured data, why graphs? Uh, well. In my opinion, graphs are an uh, excellent model for trying and understanding relationships between entities. And so these entities that you're interested in get mapped to graph vertices. And then if there's a relationship between two entities, then you represent that by having an edge. Sometimes you have multiple relationships between entities. Well, that's fine. You could have multiple edges, in which case it's called a multigraph. I'm just going to use graphs to represent both graphs and multigraphs. In many of these problems, you have labels on nodes, you have labels on edges, you have to compute those labels. Okay, so there's lots of interesting algorithm work in this area, and that's part of what I want to touch upon as we go through the talk. So there is an example of a graph. It's a web crawl graph. And if you're wondering why you can't see anything in that graph, that's because it really is an enormous graph. It's got 3 billion vertices. It's got 128 billion edges. And it's done by scraping the web. So this is the kind of graph that uh, companies like Google and Microsoft build. Each node in that graph represents a document on the web. And if there is a hyperlink between two documents, you represent that by a directed edge. And so that is one of the graphs on which, for example, all your search engines like Bing and Google do what is known as a page rank computation in order to figure out which web pages to return to you when you type in a search query. As you can see, the average degree of a vertex is just 42. And so this is also an extremely sparse graph. And even compressed, it's about one terabyte on disk. So the takeaway message is we're dealing with very large graphs, and they're also very sparse. So in fact, it turns out that a lot of big data sets are usually sparse graphs. And that's because an entity typically interacts with very few other entities. And this is a consequence of locality, both in the physical world and in the cyber world. There are about 2 billion people who use Facebook. Well, how many of them are your friends? Even if you're Bill Gates or somebody like that, it's really a very, very small fraction of people who are on your friends list. So that's what leads to sparsity.
When I go around and give talks on the importance of graphs, uh, a lot of people, particularly in companies, will come back and say, well, I've heard that uh, graphs are important, and I believe they're important, but I'm not sure I really have a graph that uh, I can tell you that I'm interested in. And so one of the things I try and do is to convince people that actually, depending on how you look at your data, graphs are actually ubiquitous. And in fact, they show up in a lot of machine learning applications, network analysis, so we already talked about web search engines, so that, that's another great area where lots and lots of graphs show up. Security, Internet of Things, and even in more traditional areas like engineering, design, and simulation. Now, I don't have the time to go through all the applications that are listed on my slide, so what I'm going to do is just focus on a few of them where we have done some work which uh, we think is interesting and which our industrial collaborators have also uh, liked. And so that is vector space models for audio, video, text, and code. So that's a machine learning application. Uh, Real-time intrusion detection in computer networks, so in the area of security. And then finally, finite element, mesh generation, and refinement. So here is a very important and very well-known machine learning application. It's called word to vec and uh, uh, let's just understand the input and the output of word to vec So the input to word to vec is a very large corpus of text, like, for example, all the pages on Wikipedia. And what you want to do, the output of word to vec is it takes every unique word in your corpus of text, and it assigns a point in some d-dimensional space to it. Okay, and you can think of that as a vector space. D is a hyperparameter, as many people have talked about. So you get to pick D, and then what word to vec does is essentially give you this embedding. So an embedding is simply a map from these words to points in your d-dimensional space. In principle, you could compute an embedding just by having a random number generator. You go through your list of words and randomly assign two different points. That's not very useful, however, because in word to vec what you want to do is you want to take words that are similar in your text. What does similarity mean? There are a whole lot of similarity metrics. But for example, if two words occur in very similar contexts, then perhaps you want to consider them to be similar. So you want to take words that are considered to be syntactically similar in your text, and then map them to points in your d-dimensional space that are close to each other. And it turns out that a very nice way to think about similarity in the text is to think about building a graph. So the word, the nodes, or the vertices, represent the words, and then if two words are related syntactically, then you want to put an edge between them, and then you're taking this huge graph and then embedding the nodes in this d-dimensional space. It's got applications in uh, natural language processing, advertising, machine translation, and so on. Uh, the challenge is uh, this is usually done using not a very deep neural network. In fact, people have shown that just a two-level neural network is enough. However, there's a lot of training data, and then it turns out the model is very complex, and so training neural networks for this particular problem may take days for many data sets. So this summer we worked with MSR, Microsoft Research, and they used our Galois system to reduce training time from several days to a few hours. And I'll tell you a little bit more about this uh, when I show you some numbers. Here's another application of graphs, this time in the security area, and in fact there are two applications over here. So the first is finding bad actors in social networks. So this is done using what's called a centrality computation, and there are many different centrality metrics, but the basic idea is if you have a social network graph, what's a social network graph? The nodes represent people, and then you have an edge between two of these vertices if those people have communicated. And what you want to do is you want to take this graph, and then you want to find who are the leaders in this. Who are the people through whom most of the communication is going? So for example, a lot of you, like me, are going to take a flight in a few hours. If I give you a route map of an airline and I say, where are the hubs? Well, you can locate them immediately by looking at the ro uh, route map because there are a lot of flights going in and out and a lot of people have to go through those hubs. But if I give you a large graph, and you can't do it visually, well then how do you identify these hubs? That's essentially the idea of centrality computation, and there are 
uh, graph algorithms called betweenness centrality, for example, that people use to find leaders in terrorist networks, for example, so that they can be taken out. So finding bad actors in social networks is an example. Another example that we have a lot of experience with is real-time intrusion detection in computer networks. So you have a computer network, there are bad actors trying to break in into the computer network. Well, how do you find these bad actors as quickly as possible and alert a human operator? This is done by building what's called an interaction graph. And an interaction graph basically has vertices for people using the network, for the files, for the I.O. ports, and so on. And then every time there's an interaction, for example, you write to a file or you read from a file, you add an edge in that graph. So it's a big evolving graph. And then you have certain patterns of paths that should not happen. So for example, if all communication from me to you has to go through Earl, well then you can look at the interaction graph and say, is there a path from me to you that does not go through Earl? So those kinds of queries are made on these interaction graphs. And then if something bad may be happening, you alert the uh, human. So we have been uh, involved in a big project with BAE for the past few years. They have used Galwa for doing uh, real-time uh, intrusion detection in networks using our system. And then the final example I want to tell you about is in simulation, modeling, graphics, and so on. So this is classical HPC stuff. If you're doing finite elements, you work with irregular meshes of uh, various kinds. And then you have to generate the meshes, you have to refine the meshes, you have to coarsen in the meshes, partition the meshes, and so on. And it turns out they can all be looked excuse me, looked at as graph computations. So we're involved in a mesh generation project currently with some uh, scientists who are mesh generation experts and they're interested in modeling pollution in Spain. And it just so happens they're from the Canary Islands. There's a university there. And if you know anything about the Canary Islands, it's a wonderful place to visit. So when they contacted me and said, well, we're from the Canary Islands and we'd like to collaborate, I said, yes. What do you want to collaborate on, right? And so it turned out it was a good collaboration. So this is just starting up because it's right in our bailiwick, so to speak. OK, so I've given you a bunch of applications, a bunch of areas where I believe graphs are ubiquitous. Now I want to give you some abstractions for thinking about graphs. How do you sort of categorize all of these graph computations? I have two slides on this. The first one is just classifying graph problems, okay? And I'm going to classify graph problems into graph generation, gra graph labeling, graph querying, and graph mining. So what, does, what do all those words mean? Well, graph generation, essentially what you're trying to do is to build or construct a big graph. And you're doing this by adding and removing vertices and edges. So the computation is mainly concerned with this big sort of evolving graph. And so finite element mesh generation, refinement, all of those things we talked about. We have a DARPA project with Rajat Manohar at Yale. He has an asynchronous circuit design tool chain. And what we're parallelizing using our graph computations, because circuits basically are big graphs. The pins are the vertices, and then the wires between these pins are the edges. So for us, everything is a graph, basically. So we were able to parallelize uh, logic synthesis, placement, routing, you know, things like that. So that's generation. Labeling, you, the graph structure is invariant, so you're not changing the adding or removing nodes and edges. However, there are labels on nodes, and you're computing what those labels should be. So all the classic graph analytics applications are examples of that. If I want to do breadth first search, single source shortest path, or this page rank computation that we talked about earlier, well, that's, those are all examples of labeling problems. Recommendation engines used by Amazon, Netflix, and so on. Those are also examples, it turns out, of labeling problems on big graphs. Then you have querying. In querying, the graph is invariant, so the structure of the graph doesn't change. The labels on the nodes are also fixed. But then what you want to do are these path and structural queries to know whether a certain kind of path exists and so on. So we've already talked about intrusion detection. Uh, and then there's a lot of commercial interest in this particular 
portion of this overall graph space. So there are companies that you might have heard of like Neo4j, Tiger Graph, Redis Graph, and so on. So these are all graph database companies. So the graph is sitting in their database and then you get to make queries of various kinds. And then the final category that I think is useful to consider is graph mining. So in graph mining, and this is very compute intensive, you're basically trying to find frequent patterns or motifs in a graph. And so there are certain motifs of interest to you, and you want to discover the most frequent of these motifs that occur. So this is called frequent subgraph mining, for example. So these are graph problems, generation, labeling, querying, and mining. Now when you have a problem, how do you solve it? Well, you have to write a program, and a long time ago, Niklaus Wirth told us a program is algorithm plus data structure. Here the data structures are graphs. And so it's useful to think about graphs in terms of their type. So in some applications you have a static graph, so the graph is fixed. In other applications the graph is changing, so all of these finite element mesh generation, etc., that we talked about, they're dynamic graphs. And then in other applications you have streaming graphs, so the entire graph is not given to you at one time, rather you get these edges incrementally, and each edge adds more information to what you know about the graph. So you have to deal with incremental presentation of the graph. Another very important aspect of graph computations is the average diameter of your graph. How many hops on the average does it take to go between two nodes? So it turns out that most of these social network graphs are called power law graphs and they tend to have a very low diameter compared to the graphs that arise in road networks or circuits, for example, which are called high diameter graphs. And the algorithm that you pick for solving a particular graph problem depends very heavily on the diameter of the graph and also on the type of the graph. How is the graph being presented to you? I'm not going to go through the classification of algorithms. They're there, but you know it's the usual task parallel versus data parallel. A lot of the uh, simpler graph algorithms are round-based. So what they do is they assign some labels to the vertices, for example, and then in each, and then they operate by a succession of rounds. In each round, they visit all the nodes of the graph. Others are asynchronous. That just means you maintain a list of active nodes, and then you just visit the active nodes when that active list active node list is empty, then you're done. So these asynchronous algorithms turn out to be much better for high diameter graphs. And so what that says essentially is if you want to cover this whole space, you need to cover a very rich range of algorithms. And these algorithms are somewhat more complicated than the ones that people traditionally use in HPC. So for example, you don't visit every node in your graph in every round. If you're using these asynchronous algorithms, you're only visiting nodes where there is work to be done. And that's a kind of phenomena you don't see very much in finite differences. For example, if I have a finite difference computation, you visit all the nodes in every iteration. So the algorithms are more complicated. You need to support these more complicated algorithms. So our system, Galois, supports all of these. And uh, Galois programs are C++ programs. But uh, they're not just random C++ programs. We give you certain patterns. You have to program according to those patterns. All the concurrency control is done within a library of data structures. So you also have to use our data structures if you want to use Galois. It runs on CPUs and GPUs. A subset of the programming model is supported on clusters. And it supports applications for all of these problems that we talked about. And it it does that by not trying to do everything itself. Rather, this is the Galois engine over here. So it's a graph engine that understands graph data structures and how to compute with graphs. And then we've implemented a whole lot of APIs. So OpenCypher, for example, is a graph querying API from Neo4j. So it was very easy to implement that API on top of Galois. Similarly, GraphBlas is an emerging standard for doing graph labeling problems. And uh, there's interest both in academia and in companies. I had a student this summer, a first year student, who just got interested in implementing GraphBlas on our system, and it took him a month to do this. So you can implement these APIs on top of our system uh, quite easily, in my opinion. So that's how we think about how to go about implementing a system for all of these different graph problems, which, as we said, require some very complicated algorithms.
Okay, I want to wrap up by just showing you a few performance numbers for some of these applications that we talked about. So this first one is word to vec So this is the work that was done at uh, Microsoft uh, using Galois. And uh, basically, the three uh, blocks over here are three different uh, uh, different corpus of text. So the biggest one is Wikipedia, which is 21 gigabytes. So that's the input to word to vec And then, as we said, there's a notion of similarity of words in that corpus of text. And then you want to find these embeddings that reflect this notion of similarity. What these guys did was to compare against two shared memory implementations of word to vec one called W. To V and the other called Gen. I'm not actually involved in this work, so I don't really know very much about these two systems. The green bar is our system, so this is what they built on top of Galois. And as you can see, the training time for Wiki in particular was reduced from a couple of days to a few hours. Uh, these numbers were collected on, uh, of course, we had, they had to use Microsoft Azure. There was no choice over there. So 32 machines, and each machine uh, Intel Xeon with 16 cores. So if you're interested in HPC, what it says is, here are some problems which are quite different from the kind of traditional HPC applications. However, they really can use reasonable size clusters. So 32 machines in the cloud. And uh, you can, if you have the right kind of system, then it can actually reduce your training time substantially for uh, problems like this. Uh, here is a different set of charts. These are for graph analytics, so these are for labeling problems. And the particular problem is labeled on top of each of these uh, blocks. So this is breadth first search, connected components, page rank, single source shortest path, and K-core. So these are all standard graph analytics applications. And uh, we work very closely with people at Intel. So they're always asking us, well, how does uh, KNL compare to Skylake? And then, of course, they're totally obsessed with NVIDIA. And how do we do compared to NVIDIA? So what these charts over here show you, the pink bars over here are on the TAC Stampede 1, which is a KNL cluster. The orange bars over here are from the latest uh, TAC machine, Stampede 2, which has Skylake processors. And then these are the GPU numbers. The blue ones are the GPU numbers. Now, we're using different numbers of machines and so on. OK, so a direct comparison is not the point of this. It's just I'm trying to tell you that our system runs on both GPUs and CPUs. And we're getting fairly good performance on both uh, CPUs and GPUs. What you notice is that for PageRank, which is a very compute intensive application, the GPU actually shines because, of course, there's a lot of compute power over there. On the other hand, connected components, it turns out it has a lot of irregular memory accesses. So there, actually, the Skylakes are doing better. So that makes everybody happy because they just say, well, there's no clear winner, but depending upon the application and the needs and so on, you know, different ones do better. Uh, these are all for ClueWeb, which was the graph that we talked about earlier. So it's got 50 billion edges. And we're using 128 machines. So again, you know, it's a fairly large, hefty uh, HPC cluster there. Uh, another question that people always ask us is, uh, Intel has this new non-volatile memory called Optane. And so they always ask, well, can you use Optane? And the answer is yes, because we have these very big graphs. And if we can store the graph in Optane, Optane just looks, Optane just looks like, is that an interrupt or? No, I have three and a half minutes. All right, I'll keep going. So uh, uh, Optane just looks like another level of the memory hierarchy. And what we were able to do recently is to take our system and store the graph in Optane. And without any changes, it essentially was able to run very big graphs, which otherwise would not fit into a single machine. So we're seeing the Optane machine here, which has six terabytes, as an alternative to using a big cluster just for the memory. Right? Instead, we could use one machine, but we have this opt-in memory. So these charts uh, are actually from Ramesh Perry at Intel. He's one of our collaborators. Uh, what he did was uh, he took GAP, which is a parallel graph library from um, 
uh, David Patterson's group at Berkeley, uh, Ligra, which is from uh, Carnegie Mellon, and uh, he compared the performance with Galois. And again, these are the same kinds of applications that we already talked about. BC is between the centrality, which we said is for centrality computations. And the takeaway point over here is that Galois programs are roughly two to four times faster than GAP and Ligra, so we do quite well there. Uh, the final chart that I have is graph mining, which we said is very compute intensive. So there are two older systems, Rstream and Arabesque, that uh, uh, have been around for a while. There's a new system for doing graph mining called Kaleido, which uh, we just became aware of. And then uh, we have our system built as an API on top of uh, Galois. And that's this pangolin, that's the API built on top of Galois. So the green lines over here are our system. And then the other systems are Rstream, Arabesque, and Kaleido. And uh, this is finding five cliques. So that's the motif you're looking for. Uh, this is frequent subgraph mining. So these are all classic graph mining uh, applications. And the takeaway here is we're substantially faster than Rstream and Arabesque. We're uh, a bit faster than Kaleido, factor of 3x. Pangolin also runs on, well, Galois runs on GPUs, and the GPU numbers are actually 14 times faster than what you see with the CPU numbers here. So the takeaway message essentially is, even though we have this very general graph engine, that generality is not coming at the expense of performance for some of the simpler problems like graph analytics, for example. So that's my summary. I have one minute, and I guess that's good. So. The, what's the takeaway message? The takeaway message is graphs are everywhere. Okay, so if you start looking for graphs, you're going to find them everywhere. Graph algorithms are very diverse, though. So I'm happy to talk with you offline about graph algorithms versus more traditional HPC algorithms. But I hinted at some of the differences already. So if you want to support the full range of graph algorithms, it's really quite complicated. And you need a system similar to what we have, because the behavior is very diverse. And you need different kinds of algorithms for these high diameter networks compared to these low diameter networks and so on. And I think we understand this space reasonably well. So that's let us build this graph engine, Gawa, which supports the full range of graph applications, such as generation and mining, which are some of the more complicated graph algorithms, without compromising on the performance for simpler algorithms like graph analytics. We think it's relatively easy to implement these APIs on top. I've tried to argue that people should program directly in Gawa. But the problem is a lot of people really hate C++, and of course Galois is C++, and then also they need to get familiar with all our idioms and patterns and so on. But I think with these APIs sitting on top, you know, it should be easier for people to write their applications. And it's used by several companies and academic groups. I'm out of time, so thank you once again for staying and listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions.